this is Rob and Carol Graham. We've been busy doing things um, inside most of the time during this lockdown, but here we are outside. Yeah, so I love being out in the autumn taking photos, so it's been a bit of frustration not to be able to do that. However, I've been setting up a studio for photography. I've also been doing projects that I've wanted to do for ages, such as videography and learning all about that. But the one thing I do miss is seeing the family, but hopefully we'll see them tomorrow. Can't wait for that. I also want to say a big shout out to anyone who is homeschooling or um, trying to work from home and homeschooling. Well done to you guys for all that you're doing. So I've been going to work uh, every day and coming home in the afternoon, just putting in in the mornings, doing lots of Zoom meetings and uh, also we use Microsoft Teams at work so um, I've been having Teams meetings and uh, uh, getting used to using eBay um, for an interesting project that uh, all will be revealed one day. <laughs> Looking, Looking forward, forward to, to seeing, seeing you all. Good morning church, what a joy it is to be worshipping together on another Sunday morning. One of the best things I think about this kind of format for church is that it's you, your family and God and that is it. And I just pray that this morning as you um, get ready to worship that you think about how you want to best worship God this morning. Um, don't be afraid to stand up in your living room or to kneel down, to raise your hands or do whatever you would like to do to worship God this morning. So um, let's join together as we sing Waymaker. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
sing this out even when we don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 I'm loving this new series of Waymaker at the moment and love that song that we just sung. I feel like it speaks of so many truths about who God is. This morning, we're looking at our God as a promise keeper. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't know if God's ever given me a promise, but I can confirm that no matter who you are, God has given you hundreds of promises because they're right here in the book that He has given us in the Bible. In Isaiah 40, God promises that those who hope in the Lord will find new strength. In Romans 10, He promises that those who confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord will be saved. And in Deuteronomy 31, He promises that He will go before us, that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Our God has given us so many promises. And today we're going to be learning more about Him as a promise keeper. Let's praise Him this morning and pray. Lord God, we just thank You so much, Father, for who You are. We thank You, God, that You have given us hundreds and hundreds of promises and that You keep each one, Lord. We thank You that You are a promise keeper. God, we just thank You that no matter who we are or where we've come from or even our story, that these promises are still the same for us and you still keep them for us, Lord. God, I just want to thank you this morning for our church family. I thank you that we can still come together, even if it is in a different way, and worship you, Lord. I thank you so much for the generosity of our church and for the finances that have been coming in, Lord. Thank you that that you are helping us to use them in the way that, that you want them to be used, God. And we, we pray that that continues to happen, Lord. God, we just thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we love you, we worship you, and we praise your mighty name this morning. Amen. Welcome back to church and welcome to our series Waymaker. We really do hope that you've been enjoying this series. I know it's something that, like James said last week, God really laid on our hearts. And so we've been really excited to be able to bring the ones that we've brought to you over the last couple of weeks. And we're going to continue that series today looking at God, our Waymaker. God that makes a way through the storms, through the waters, through the fire, even through pandemics. And today we're going to be looking at God as our promise keeper. So what is a promise? If you look up the dictionary, you'll find a 
a few different definitions. The ones that I found that I thought really helped me to understand more what it was is it's a declaration that one will do or refrain from doing something specified, to pledge to do, to bring about or to provide. It can also be a legally defining declaration. That means a person has a right to the decision that's been made. They have the right to expect and even to claim that the performance that has been offered will actually happen for them. Some other words that might be the same as that is an oath, a pledge, a vow, a covenant, even giving your word or swearing, not the bad sort of swearing, obviously, the swear that I'm going to do that for you. If you want to know how many promises are in the Bible, as a good theological student, I went straight to Google and searched it. And it came up with this range from between 3,000 to 7,487. I'm sure if I had the time to search deeper, I could probably come up with the exact amount of promises. But either way, it's a lot. There are a lot of promises in God's word. And each one of these promises reveal God's particular, unchangeable commitment to us. And they are promises that we can absolutely, totally depend upon. They are, have, all have eternal purpose or a particular purpose that God has in mind when he created these promises for us. James last week shared that struggle that we can face to believe that miracles still happen today. And today we're going to face a similar struggle once again, a struggle to trust that God actually still keeps his promises. I don't know about you, but, you know, I've read a lot of these promises in God's word, and sometimes I actually don't feel his peace and his hope. I don't feel his protection. And sometimes I don't even feel like God's making a way for me. I feel like I'm struggling to make my own way through this world. Perhaps for you, it should took some marriage vows and the other person hasn't kept their side of their commitment, their agreement, their covenant. Or perhaps we couldn't keep our side to that agreement. Maybe you've signed a covenant or you've signed a contract at work and it just actually didn't work out the way that you expected it to. You see, our past experience can actually affect our ability to trust not only in other people's promises, but in God's promises as well. See, James briefly shared last week this one particular paragraph that really struck me and got me thinking. I was already thinking about what we were going to do this week. And it was this, this statement. It says, Our ability to have faith, to trust in the promises of the future are often rooted in the past. See, in this present tension that we live in, in this space between the past and the future, there's this struggle. Lisa Tzerk, in her book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, refers to this as the space between the two gardens, between the Garden of Eden and the beautiful gardens that we will find in heaven. And so to live as a committed follower of Jesus Christ, we'll need to know how to be able to trust, to trust that God is our promise keeper and to trust in this present struggle that we might be facing, in this space between those past promises and our future hope. And in that space, we can actually find that there is purpose. See, there's purpose in our past promises. Throughout the Bible, we see that God is making a way. Let's take a look at Abram. There's so many examples in the Bible, but Abram had some grand promises given to him by God. Let's just read a couple of small verses within Genesis. Genesis 12, verse 2. God's promise to Abram was, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Further along in chapter 15, verse 1. God also said, don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and reward your reward will be great. Further along in verse 5, it says, the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. 
That is how many descendants you will have. See, Abram was no different to us. He struggled. He questioned God. He wondered, how are these promises you are giving me even possible? I don't even have a son, so how are my descendants going to outnumber the stars in the sky? And what I love about God is that he didn't punish this doubt that Abram had. He simply reinforced his promises because God's plan was way bigger than Abram's. See, there's actually purpose in each of these promises that God places within his word, the promises he speaks over our lives. And these promises, this promise to Abram, actually opened up the way for us to be in a relationship with God. See, God was making a way. And in remembering these past promises, we can see purpose. We can see that they did possess the promised land. We know that God is faithful when we look back at these promises. We know that he made a way. And as we read God's word from our point in history, we can see that there's purpose in these promises. And what was their present struggle, that struggle to believe the promise way back then, became our future hope. And there was purpose in that promise. And so in this present struggle, in this place where we are now, living between these two gardens, in the in-between space, there's purpose. There's purpose in this process. There's purpose in this struggle. Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven, sorry, Purpose Driven Life, has actually sold over 50 million copies in more than 85 different languages. And the reason why it sold so many is it answers the question the most basic question that everyone faces in life. Why am I here and what is my purpose? Self-help books suggest that people should look within, look at their own desires, their own dreams. But Rick Warren says that the starting place must be with God and his eternal purposes for each life. I feel like sometimes as a follower of Christ, we actually get this around the wrong way. We seek the promise and not the purpose. It becomes all about us. What can God do for me? What has God promised me? And in this fast-paced, self-focused world, we seek the easy way, the quick fix. We know that God is good. We know that there are these amazing benefits. There's eternal life. There's love. There's hope. There's joy. There's peace. So why wouldn't we sign up for that? Why wouldn't we commit to that? And what we often do is we tick the box and we say, yes, that's what we want. Sort of like, you know, those boxes when you're buying a new app or you're agreeing to something and there's so much word in there and you go, yes, I want it. I want it now. So we tick the terms and the conditions without even actually looking at what that means. We want to play now. And we want to read the instructions later. But when it doesn't meet our need, we wonder what went wrong. When things become difficult, when we begin to struggle, we wonder why isn't this living up to my expectation? And in the case of our faith, we wonder why hasn't God kept his promise? You know, all those good promises, those ones like, I will protect you, Psalm 91. I give you perfect peace, Psalm 85, verse 8. We all know this one. I have a perfect plan for you, Jeremiah 29, 11. I comfort you, Isaiah 51, 12. I give you freedom, 2 Corinthians 4, 15. I give you purpose, Matthew 10, 39. I will fight for you, Deuteronomy 24. I love you, John 3, 16. In a world of Facebook and Twitter quotes, we can often forget the part that we have to play. And during our Waymaker series so far, we've realised in every aspect, God has a purpose for each one of us, a part for us to play. So there's actually purpose in this process. There's purpose in the struggle. And the purpose is to grow us into God's image. Purpose for others 
to see Christ in us. And if we were to dig a bit deeper into each one of those passages, we would discover that we do have a part to play. That relationship with God is actually a two-way street. Just within those eight passages that I just read out to you, here's some things that we can discover. I can discover that God actually requires me to have a holy reverence for him. He wants me to listen to what he has to say, to not fear what people might do to me. He tells me not to dread the darkness, not to dread the struggle, that I am to make the Lord my refuge, to make the Most High my shelter, that I am to love God, to trust God, to pray to God, to call out to God. I'm to look for God in the situation. I'm to listen, to wait, and to be still. I'm not to give up, but I am to give up my way to lay down my life. I'm not to lose heart and not panic. I'm not to tremble, but I am to believe in God. See, there's purpose in each one of these promises. There's purpose in that process of us struggling within those promises. And that purpose is helping us to grow up, to grow into committed followers, to live a purpose-driven life. And the purpose, the mission, actually isn't about us. It's all about God. And it's all about bringing other people to God. See, God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in relationship with him and to grow in relationship with others. That is God's purpose. And that purpose is reflected in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And we see that in the vision of our church. We actually see that in the vision that Jesus had for the church, the worldwide church, that we are to connect with God through worship through this holy reverence and worshipping God with all our mind, soul, heart and strength. We are to grow in our relationship with God. That's discipleship. That's being able to stand up and grow up and begin to do the things that God has called us to do. We are actually called to serve through ministry, to use our God-given gifts to serve God and to serve others. We are also told that we are to belong through fellowship. See, God wants us to be part of his family. It's way bigger than just us. There's this whole family that God wants us to be part of. He wants us to have this sense of belonging. And we are also to build through evangelism. We are to live out this blessed lifestyle where we serve others and pray for others and share our story so that they might come to know Christ. See, there's definite purpose in this process. There's purpose in this present struggle that we face. And God knows that before we can eternally dwell, we'll need to learn how to wrestle well. In the new Eden, in our promised land, we won't need to wrestle because all will be well. That is the promise. And there's purpose in that promise, in that struggle. We fulfill our promise when we grow in relationship with God. We fulfill the purpose that God has for us. And in that purpose, in fulfilling that purpose, we actually find hope. We find that future hope. We live in light of the future hope. We live in light of what Christ has done for us. We too will be victorious because Jesus was victorious. And victorious people are not meant to just settle for normal. We're meant to live this incredible life as followers of Christ, trusting in God's promises, trusting in his purpose. See, our past promise becomes our present help, our future hope. Our purpose is to live in such a way as to point others to that future hope, to eternal life. 
I believe one of the greatest promises in God's Word is one that probably all of us know. And that's John 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through them. You see, in Jesus' birth, in his death, and in his resurrection, so many promises were fulfilled. We can count on God to fulfill those promises, those past promises. So this morning, as we come to communion, I'm going to invite you to actually pause and prepare. So as we come to this space of communion, let us remember that past promise. Let us remember the future hope. See, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, there was a struggle. He knew what he faced the next day. And in that place, in that present struggle, he sat around a table with his disciples And he broke bread and he said to them, do this in remembrance of me. See, Jesus is asking us to remember what he did, to remember that his body was broken. And in remembering that, we remember that past promise. We remember that in him fulfilling that promise, that he was actually breaking the older way. He was making a way for us. He was breaking away the old covenant to make way for the new, a future promise, an eternal hope. So as we eat the bread together this morning, let's remember all Christ did for us on the cross. I invite you to just hold on to the juice. It represents Christ's blood. His blood in that struggle that was shed for you. The promise of forgiveness of our sins. The promise of eternal life. A future hope. A new covenant. A new beginning a freeing from our past. The ability to trust God, that he is our promise keeper, to believe in him. So as you reflect on the words of this song that's coming up called King of Kings, I invite you to hold on to the juice, to close your eyes wherever you are, to allow the words of this song to just go into your heart to remember our promise keeper to know that you can place your trust in him that your life in God's hands is safe you are forgiven you are cleansed God is our promise keeper I leave you with these words from the song. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ has rescued me. He has made a way. God is our way maker, our miracle worker, and our promise keeper. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope. From heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle. the 
Thank you so much for joining with us in church this morning. But remember, the service doesn't stop here. Um, It's time to go into your life groups or chat with your family. There were discussion questions sent through. So um, chat about what you learned today, what you were challenged by today and what inspired you this morning. Um, Have an absolutely blessed week. I cannot wait to see you all again, hopefully soon.